actually love your photography. I think it's actually some of the best I've seen. But real quick, I also want to point out to the audience that you were one of the heroes involved with our campaign out here for social services because a musical project that actually blows me away that you're working with now, Small Town Glory, donated a song to the album for social services. And I was blown away by how good it was. I have to tell you, a lot of times you get these kind of people involved and you're not really sure, but you are on to some exceptional stuff and you're playing some gigs. Yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, um, started doing gigs now, which is good. It's been well overdue. I mean, to be long so glad. Time. I mean, yeah. to be honest with you, I mean, it's uh, the EP came out in two. I couldn't believe this. I was looking at the dates on the EP, and it's 2016, and I was absolutely shocked. But the problem is, is holding musicians together. If you haven't got a big budget and you're doing building shows, it it takes a lot for people to dedicate the time and energy because they've got to earn a living they've got to do anything else and it's not like i've got a name that i can use so i'm starting literally from the ground up like all those garage bands have to you have to start at the bottom and work your way up so it, it takes time and it takes um a lot of conviction yeah time and conviction it also helps when the talent is there which it clearly is in your case and i think it's interesting don't you think you have like don't I mean, you have a pretty good resume. I mean, obviously, I blew it on the toilets reference, but I mean, <laughs> like you're like one of those blame, guys. Blame the researcher. That's what I always say. <laughs> yeah, that's what they're paid for. Blame the researcher. You know, it, no, it's funny because uh, you know, it's we you you, you there. Look, you to to be honest with you, your 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 lineage is a pretty good one. Like people know what you've done. So I would think, do musicians are they drawn to that, or is that fun, or do they are they in, insecure by that? Or do they, I mean, are you... I mean, it's not interrupt, but I, it's, it, it's a real case of the economics have got to work. So, right. you know, I mean, the gigs pay the musicians. I'm not fully loaded in the sense I can support a group. Um, I haven't got lots of merchandising or all those things that, you know, a group can use to sell that. So in other words, what I do, I share everything with my band members when we play. Mm -hmm. so, and we're starting off small so at the end of the day i have got people with me now who do it because they want to do it not because they're in it for the money they're just in it because they love doing the music and to me that is the biggest sort of uh pass on the back or you want to want to call it the endorsement a, a, a musician could hope for do you prefer it now with all these tools available to you modern technology and these things that can help get a career going it's a double-edged sword of course because you know, it doesn't have sort of the liquidity that it once did. But do you prefer the situation now or do you prefer it when you first started out and you had to like hit like the, the you know, the, the 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 taverns and the pubs and start playing around to build a name? Was that a better time to get a career going with a band or is now better? To be honest with you, for me, that was that was honesty. I mean, nowadays, if you've got people who can handle your social media, mm -hmm. you can hype it up. I mean, the end of the day, payola was always an issue with every musical artist really all the way back from the 30s 40s 50s right up yeah. to today in different shape different shapes and sizes different ways it still goes on we all know that and but when we started off literally we were busking outside a church in St Martin's in the field in London we just had our three guitars and a tambourine and we were just doing our thing and if the song spoke to people bit by bit the word would get out and that was kind of you're doing it the honest way you're working from the ground up and we built a very loyal following um the other night i did a show in london i did declaration album it's the first time i've ever performed it myself i mean i've obviously co-writer with mike on basically 90 percent of the songs of the record but i'd never performed those songs live anywhere before and mm. I thought it was 40 years since that album came out. And it was a landmark America, sort of landmark for us in America. Um, and I really wanted to revisit that and just to see how it felt. And I was still proud today of those songs as basically the day they were recorded. It's hard for me to hear the term 40 years because it doesn't seem like it was four <laughs> yeah. decades. No, I, I totally agree with you. I must admit, it's quite painful. I see say to the kids nowadays, live every day like it was your last because you've got to make most of the time because it it's cruelly taken away from people really quickly for sure and it's gone overnight man it's tragic but honestly i love that album i loved a lot of what you've done but i actually i gotta tell you man you're one of these guys that i was just talking about you the other day because we were talking with some friends of ours where we're based over at universal about artists who have made the jump into the current timeline with real good work 
And I was saying, you know, one of the, I was saying, you're one of the guys that surprised me because what you're doing now with small town glory, I thought this is really good. Like this isn't like some backwoods project for therapy reasons. It probably is that as well. But I was like, <laughs> you've made the jump where what you're doing now is just as magnetic as what you've done in the past. And I think that's a very fortunate place to be talent wise, man. You can do a lot. If you've got the talent, you guys are cutting the songs. Then the rest seems to come together easy in my mind. Speaking as your, you know, your West Coast representative, Eddie, uh, you know, that's just my that's just my thought process. But I don't know the insanity that goes with these things. And do you and do you guys get along? Do you guys does does the band get along? Does the band want to take the next step, or do you got a guy with like a wife and kids just like oh, I've got to keep my day job at the pub, or how does it go? Well, to be honest with you, I mean, it's I mean, the last show we played um, in London, we played a show just before Christmas, and yes, and. Because I, when we did the EP, I um, did the EP with another chap, Paul Evans, who was singing, who ironically played with me the other night at the show. But it's now me fronting the group because I decided if I'm going to do this, I've got to be the person standing at the front. I can't always hand the responsibility off to other people. Mm -hmm. And so, again, it's something I only have used to do on the one or two songs with the alarm. So I decided to give it my all myself. And uh, I really enjoyed the challenge. It's good for me mentally as well to actually remember yeah. the lyrics. Um, it's good for me to challenge when I get in front of an audience. And to be honest, I really enjoy it. I love that sort of, that bond you have with an audience. And that's really the basis of what the alarm had, was the audience became, we all became one for that moment in that place at that time. And I tried to bring that element of it back in with small town glory that's why the name comes from basically i come from a small town and it was always after trying to make things better it was a positive gesture in the name and i'm carried out through with all the other songs all the songs i do have a story mm -hmm. and that's it because then when i'm singing that i can visualize that story at a place a moment in time or an affair that went wrong or a marriage that didn't last. So all these things that we all go through as human beings, those emotions, is trying to put those into a place and time. So to me, I'm fronting that out. I can't give that responsibility to somebody else because the songs are quite personal. Yeah, and that makes a lot of sense. You have to step in front of it and uh, take the bullet, so to speak. Hey, I'm Alex from Quiet Riot. I'm Dizzy from Guns N' Roses. I'm Johnny from Typo Negative. I'm Mike from Moss. Help us cure NMOSD and, and with, with it, cancer. cancer. Go to Guppy Jackson Foundation and donate, donate now. <laughs> because bands are complex. I mean, I think people, they see the flair and the spotlight of it and they all think it's easy, but bands are complex, man. There's a, It's hard to make those things work, but when you do this in certain... Yeah. yeah, it is a marriage, and a marriage takes working out. Sometimes it doesn't work. I mean, the alarm worked for, we we were sort of, dare I say it, in inverted commas, married for about 14 years, yeah. living in each other's pockets. I used to see more of those guys than I did of my wife. Right. Right? We were living on a tour bus, literally living feet apart on the stage, in interviews, on television, and in a bus, literally day in, day out for eight months, say nine months a year. I yeah, mean, I don't think is, you don't the, see your wife that much. No, I don't think I could make that work myself, to be <laughs> honest with you. I don't think I could make that work with any. I mean, look at groups like the Sex Pistols, where it didn't work at all. You know, it seemed. Uh, but it's funny because like I was I remember talking to Kurt Smith. I was like, it's got to be easier for you. There's just two guys. And his response was. Well, there's no one to complain to. You know, yes. speaking of tears of fear, there's no one to complain to. Like, at least in a band, there's a unionized effort. I could talk to the drummer or the bass player. He might see my point of view. But with me, there's no one. To, I just walk away and be like, F this guy. Anyway, I thought it was kind of funny. So that's the sort of the... But I think you're probably at a place now where appreciation plays a role with this new venture. Like, you understand that even if you take the stage, however large or however small, that's a magical moment ready to happen that not everyone has the privilege to live through. Yeah. And you're getting ready to go out there and, per, you know, perform your art for people mm -hmm. to experience. Like, that's, when you think about that in its purest concept, that's a huge deal. Yeah. I mean, and to be honest, with you, it is a challenge that I really, I, I, when I sort of grasped that sort of the nettle of I had to actually go out there and do it, it was something mm -hmm. that 
I didn't know how I would do it until I did it. It's one of those things that when you try something for the first time, you've really, you either got to put your heart and soul into it or you, you, you can't yeah. just tip your toes in because you're out there on your own and doing it. And to be honest with you, I mean, I spent years in a sense that at the back, and I wouldn't say the back of the stage, but behind Mike's, well, basically living in, in his shadow, for want of a better word. And so to actually get to the front, I realised it, it does take a lot of conviction to actually do it and belief in yourself. But the one thing the songs have done is I think they've given me that belief in myself. So I don't feel now that it's a ch such a challenge to do it because I'm relating those songs. And as long as the songs are, I'm, I've got, I believe in them, then it's it's not as difficult as I first thought. Do you have a favorite moment like in your songwriting career where all of a sudden in the studio or live, it just kind of clicked and like, and you can't believe like, damn, I, I partly put that together. Like, are you, are you stunned by anything of your, from your resume? Well, that's a really good question. That's a really, <laughs> really good question. Yeah. I think one of the moments I think, because it's when you stand on your own two feet, Mm -hmm. When I was doing um, the song "Hi Hi Hi," which you've got, um, I believe, um, queued up somewhere, I was I spent a long time writing the string arrangement for that song, um, and it was a challenge. I wrote the string arrangement. I then drafted in a, a lady called Stella in to help me score it for other musicians, and then that moment I heard it coming back through the speakers was probably the moment because it's the most musical moment I think I've ever achieved because it was something literally in my head that I've managed to get out. And I think that was almost, hearing your song played in that, in that way. It really, yeah, it really, I would say lifted me up, but it, it felt fantastic. Yeah. It was special that moment. Yeah. Give me the, give me your favorite moment. I mean, you're a man about town you've got uh, several gigs in front of you tonight and you got a bolt, but give me a favorite moment from your career. Like, give me the moment, the moment where like things click, like, damn, I'm not going to have to become a garage mechanic or a school teacher. Uh, yeah, not that th it's... those are good jobs by the way. Uh, but I mean, like where things were like the risk is working. It, it's working. I'm, I'm going to get a check from this, you know? Yeah. I'll tell you what, one of the best moments ever, I think, was I was backstage at Berkeley with Neil Young and Bob Dylan. Everyone else had gone off. I was in a room. I was working on a song called How the Mighty Fall. Who should walk in? But Bob and Neil sat down opposite with their guitars. All three of us are just playing. And I'll tell you what, at that point, I thought, OK, is this a dream? Is this what is this? I played through the song. And then basically it was something I was working on for the next record. And that moment, I realised, thinking, people would kill to be in this room at that time, you playing your song to Bob and Neil. And I just went, OK, this doesn't, it doesn't get more surreal than this. So was that where the rumours started to surface that Neil Young developed a festering hatred for the alarm because he couldn't lure the bass player away <laughs> to work <laughs> with him? on is that where that feud started to spring up was backstage is that where that, i mean let me ask you this like how does that sort of end because i would imagine you probably don't want the moment to end so like your guys are playing a song like are you stretching the song out to play longer with them or what are you well, doing can, now all i can say is neil then said you know basically it was a great story actually um we got we i think nearly we we, we managed to do rocking in the free world be, i think nearly before neil did because Elliot Roberts, his manager at the time, played us the song Rockin' in the Free World, I think before it even was released. Wow. And we were playing that song. like We actually ended up recording it, but Neil's version was far better than ours, I'll be honest. But, I mean, um, it was one of those moments you, you have an opportunity. And it's strange about music. It's sometimes it's as much who you know, the right place at the right time, sliding doors and all those cliches. Mm. But we were very lucky to be, you know, we played the last shows with Queen at Wembley, the one that everyone sees now, the kind of magic one on the television. We we played that show with them. Um, yeah, we, it, we, you know, we broke you, you two when they did Under a Blood Red Sky that really bro broke them in America. We were playing on tour with them and we were so fortunate to be in the right place at the right time. But we managed to get on with all these artists and 
they all seem to take a, take a shine to us. So well, we were very fortunate. Isn't that the X factor, though, that a lot of young people don't appreciate that it's not just the talent, but your its ability to get along with additional talent. You know, yeah. it's, it's it's your ability to actually get in. It's not just getting into the room. It's can you stay in the room? How did it but work with you, like, were you were, were you the opener, or how did it go? Oh, in excess opened, mm -hmm. and we were next on the bill. Then status quo, and then queen. Okay, right. So in the UK, that was a big deal, um, really big, because quo in the UK were the ZZ top of the UK. Right. So they're a big deal, right? right. Um, in excess, this little band from Australia who went on to do a rather amazing things, mm. but um, that they opened the, the show and they were fantastic. And then we came on because we had a big following in the UK as well. But the best thing is we were asked to do the show by Brian May. He they were doing a gig at um, when it's in Rome. And they asked us to do the shows in Rome and London, but we couldn't do the Rome show. He said, but you've got to do the show, the last shows at Wembley. They didn't know it was their last shows. They got, you know, what a shame, but they didn't know. But they said, you must play with us at Wembley. We did two shows at Wembley with them. Absolutely amazing. It was an amazing opportunity. Yeah, I, I mean, that must, <laughs> yeah. that must be yeah. something to have Brian May ask you to do the shows. Yeah. He even gave Dave, my guitar player, one of his sixpence he uses to play his guitar with. Really, Which I thought was sweet. yeah, really nice. It was a lovely That's... chat, it still is. Yeah, it's funny. Your story reminds me of I was talking to like a British rock legend a while ago, and he was telling about the early days on tour with both the police and squeeze. Mm -hmm. And he like wanted a new amp, and the Copeland was managing. He said, There's no money for an amp, there's no money. He's like, It's all the money's going to all this. The... And he goes, Hey, look, squeeze okay, but the police, who's ever going to hear of these fucking guys? Give me the money. <laughs> it's just so, it's just so exactly. funny, like the the perception of the light up at the time versus what people go on to do. But you know what, though, man, I got to give Brian May credit. He knew who to ask. Undoubtedly, you delivered. It was just a yeah. great performance. And yeah. you must sit back and go, "Where's the book, Eddie? Where are you gonna? When are you gonna grace us all with all the memories and the, the pictures?" Anecdotes. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I've got so many funny anecdotes. I mean, the the funny thing is, is when you do music as long as I did as, with the alarm. I mean, some of the things that happened were, were quite comical. It's it's not quite Spinal Tap, but it's probably you could put some of them into a you know into some funny things. Some of it would be X-rated. Some of it would be just unrepeatable. Um, some of it was just so funny that you would probably need hospital treatment because it it was rib tickingly funny. But it was all part of being in a group because you never quite knew from one day to the next. You're dealing with human beings and we all have our ups and downs, our ins and outs, all the things that happen to us. And it is we, we as a species are ultimately fascinating, um, not just clinically, but socially we are. And some of the things that happen to bands are just I don't know when you set out with this little dream of yours to write a few songs, you never quite know where this journey is going to take you. And um, surprisingly, some people, you know, got dropped off at the first bus stop. We managed to sort of hitch a lift right the way through to 12 to 14 years of it. So um, we had quite a few funny scenarios along the way. Do you, what's the funniest thing that comes to mind when you think of funny stories from your, <sighs> your rock and roll days? Honestly, you, give me I one. I know you probably. I'll, I'll give you one story. And it's, I was going to play a harmonica, but I just realized I put them away which is probably a good thing for the listeners. They don't want to turn off. Um, we did a show in London. We had um, a really big build-up. We were just about to break through in the UK. We were about to have our first hit record. And we played a show at the Hammersmith Palais. And um, the lights go down. Bands make their way onto the stage. Mike Peters runs to the front of the stage. He believed that there was a little ramp that went to the audience. <clears throat> That had sadly been taken away. So oh. then he decides to fall about six to seven feet into where the security is, right? So bless him, he hadn't got a clue what had happened because he just ran out expecting to have this ramp in front of him disappeared. So of course he disappears. You've seen it happen with Dave Grohl, all these people fall off stage, break mm -hmm. limbs. And it's sometimes you think, how does that happen in a professional health and safety environment? Well, it does, and it happened. But the worst thing about it was if he didn't want something else to make it worse, he got himself back on stage with the help of one of our roadies, 
got into the song and he used to keep his harmonica in his back pocket. So he must have landed on his butt when he landed, but got himself up, dusted himself down, started the show. I think he got to the second song, picked up his harmonica and started playing possibly the worst sound I'd ever come out of a wind instrument. Um, and he'd obviously fallen on his bum, mm -hmm. squashed the harmonica. It sounded, it was just unbelievable, like a, like a school kid's kind of, you know, little trumpet. But the worst thing is to rub salt into the wound. The next week, it there was a big article in one of the big music papers in the UK, which said, it was like a, um, they use it as an advert now, it's possibly the best lager in the world, possibly this, mm. possibly that. It just said, possibly the worst harmonica player of all time. Unbeknown to him, he'd fallen six to seven feet and landed on his bum. Right. And, the reason why he sounded so bad, not because he couldn't play it, because unfortunately he'd landed on his ass. Yeah. Brother, so, you're not kidding. That is right out of Spinal Tap. That is a moment you just go, life is cruel, mm. because you're thinking, mm. bad enough to fall off, but to re be reminded of that for all the wrong reasons a couple of, a week or so later. That is the kind of world that we live in. and it. So social media nowadays it is a bit more instant. That would have been probably splashed over everything with a video clip as well but now, but nowadays in those days at least you used to take one week to get to the people nowadays it takes about one second but don't you don't you in a sense love that like wouldn't you pass that around and be like okay here's going into our next show look at this look at what we've got to resurrect like isn't that motivation for you like artists who i mean you guys have got some grit They'll always have had some grit so don't you put that up there and be like we've got to show this clown up and show this clown in the audience who we are. So did you use that as some kind of like, like inspiration to get back in the fight? Like it's a rock and roll is a street fight in a sense, psychologically speaking, you are always trying to pick yourself up off the planks. We, came from, a very, we came from a small town, really small mm -hmm. town to get from our town to Liverpool used to take about an hour, right. To play mm -hmm. one show. Okay. To get to London, to move lock, stock and barrel to London, took balls to do that because it, it, you literally give up everything you had and go to somewhere where you've got nothing. You're a, enough, a small person in a very large city, mm. a musically vast city. To make, to even be heard in that city is a miracle. There are thousands of musicians striving for that stage, that moment, that platform. Right. That's what made us stronger because every time we had a setback, you already had the backbone of knowing it, how, how, what struggle it was to get there in the first place. So in a sense, what doesn't beat you always makes you stronger. And uh, we had to fight a lot for a lot of things. And, you know, we never gave up fighting until the very, very end. And that was the moment that disappointed me when the group finally ended is one of the members gave up on it. And that was always the moment, because I never did. So it was tricky. And that was the hardest thing of any musician to finally let go and thinking, right, okay, well, we've done our best, but that, no more. And that was probably the most, I think, one of the most uh, the hardest things I think I've ever been through, actually. Were you ever able to put that right, your, your feelings yeah. about that moment? Were you ever able to convey or sort of, I don't know that you repair that, but were you able to ever... Were you ever ever able to get that kind of off your chest? What no. happened there? No, I don't think it, it's a, it's it's scar tissue. Mm -hmm. I think any musician will say you when you start out as a band and then it's all normally four members. You think or five, it doesn't matter how many members, but you start out as a unit and you're only as strong as your weakest link. Yeah. In the end, we found. I never thought this, but we found our weakest link. And that was it. And that was the moment I realized he didn't expect that. And um, it was, yeah, it was a shocker. I really was, yeah. Do you ever get over it? No, you don't, because no. you don't, otherwise you would know that it's going to happen. But you know, I don't think so, I never did, no. I think, I think I'll probably take it with my chicken. I'm not bitter anymore. I wasn't for a long, long time. I think now I look back disappointed. Yeah, disappointed. Yeah. I, think, yeah. I mean, how, how are you on time? Do you have to go? I do actually, unfortunately, but I'd love to come back again. 
Um, he's yeah, because like, thank you for the I, opportunity to talk. Is I could talk until the cows come home. Um, no, you so know, yeah, off at some point. <laughs> my, my fault, Agent McDonald. Honestly, we, you know, we're uh, we're in a fire. I mean, I really wanted to get you on quick for the publicity purposes of it, and we can do whatever you need us to do. Small town glory related. I mean, I know we're in LA, but we do have sort of a global internet reach that could help out. I just, I just loved what you did with the band, and I loved what you did for social services getting involved. So I feel I have a mafia debt there. I am going to get. I'm now the harmonica guy that fell off the stage with the audience because they're going to be like. How dare you get to this guy late and he's got to leave before the next couple of questions. But maybe, uh, you know, we can do kind of a sort of a semi-regular publicity thing for you where you get on for a few minutes and we talk up the band. But you got time for a part. Do you have can you do a part two at some point? I would love to. I mean, to be honest with you, I mean, I I like to think I speak for musicians all over. Mm -hmm. A lot of them, in a way, I just echo their feelings and what they've been through and so on and so on. And that's the thing, isn't it? Because we all go through a similar journey, ups and downs, ins and outs, as I said before, lots of emotion goes into what you do. It's not a case of literally just get a guitar, bang a tune out, and that's it. Often there's so much more behind the scenes that people never see. And in a way, you still want to inspire people. That's the thing is to get on that stage and do it, to get behind people like yourself. The answer is you inspire people. Your questions inspire people because they're thought through, they're thoughtful and they're considerate. And that is my point. Sometimes it's good to have that conversation and people listen to this. Hopefully they'll take something away from it and go, it's in, it's enriching. And hopefully that's what we can do together. So we, I'd love to do a part two. It'd be fabulous. Yeah, great. I, I would love it too. And thank you for the compliment. I want to say, actually, I, I, I want a book from you. And I'm I actually, I'd love to see if we can get to actually score some small town glory West Coast dates. But on in truth, what the audience should take away from this is the exceptional musical lineage and what you've given us over the years, we know, and we're indebted to you for. But the band that you're in now is absolutely a surprising juggernaut of musical fun. And I would encourage people to take a moment and just embrace it for what it is and what you're doing, because I loved it. I loved what I heard. And we're going to play some now. We're going to cut away. I'm going to give... Eddie, the final word here. You got the final 10 seconds, buddy. Go. Okay. Thanks, Ethan. Well, the song you're about to hear, hopefully, is going to be called Hi, Hi, Hi. It's the first track on our EP, even though the set listing or on the actual record was wrong. My mistake. I'm dyslexic. I'm going to own up and say I'm sorry, but so proud of the song. When we did it, I I'm hopefully you enjoy it as much as I did making it. Well, from one dyslexic to another, buddy, thank you for your time. And that is obviously going to be the song now. Way to call it. Uh, let's rock. Eddie McDonald, stay awesome, buddy. We love you. Thank you. Your road to redemption is paved with tombstones. No quarter. Kill all masters. Go to nocorderkillallmasters.com. Read it all.